All right, this next tip or technique I'm going to show you might almost be considered anti-Pythonic. Let's look at the Xenopython and see what it says. So recall the Xenopython says special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. So that leads to a really clean and simple and easy to understand language, often with one way to do things instead of three or four. That's awesome. However, it also says practicality beats purity. So let me give you a heavy dose of practicality involving dictionaries and memory in Python. So here's the server memory process for the web servers of this company called Oyster.com. They do like hotel booking and that kind of stuff. They wrote a nice blog post about it. We'll look at it in a second. They were storing a lot of stuff in memory cached using Python objects. They use this concept of slots, which we're going to talk about, to go and save nine gigabytes of RAM on their server. And it literally just took one line of code. This will give us a chance to look inside at the backend store for custom objects, which normally is a really good thing to have, but every now and then can be trouble, as you can see here. So we're over here in Windows 10, and this is Oyster.com. You can see it's all about booking hotels that have been checked out by real people. Sounds cool. Here's their blog post talking about how they use slots on this image class that they cache heavily. Let's go and look at this in a different example that I've created for you in PyCharm. We're over here in Windows 10 because the tools to look at the process details and understand its memory usage and CPU usage are really great on Windows. So we're going to work with four types holding the same information. We're going to have a tuple which holds four values. They're unnamed. We're going to have a thing called an immutable thing tuple. We're using this name tuple to create it. It has values A, B, C, and D. We're going to have a regular class, a plain old class that has four values, A, B, and C, and D, storing those on its instance. And we're going to use slots with this thing we're calling an immutable thing. It's a little bit wrong. It's immutable in that it can't have new attributes, but the values A, B, C, and D, those can change. By adding this slots here, what we're going to do is, remember, every normal object has a dictionary backing store. And so if I looked at self.dunderdict, you would see that it had four entries, A, B, C, and D, and the values would be whatever the values of A, B, C, and D were passed in, right? Each instance of mutable thing has its own separate copy of the dictionary, which means it has its own separate copy of the keys as well. On the other hand, this one, when you define slots, it says, look, this type holds four and exactly four things with this name, and we can put the, the storage of those slots into the type, which is a singleton, instead of to the instance variables, which there may be millions. So let's look at the code below where we create a bunch of these and we look at the memory pressure and behavior of the different items. So notice we have one million items we're going to work with. We're going to put them into this list. What we're going to do is we're going to time every one of these operations the same. We're going to choose one of the four options, loop one, loop two, loop three, loop four. Loop one is going to use straight regular tuples and it's going to allocate move that over for just a moment so it's maybe more obvious. It's going to allocate in line a tuple with four values, n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, n plus four, and it's going to put it into our list. So here we'll have in memory one million of these tuples. We're going to determine how long that takes. Here you see finished, waiting, done a certain amount of time, and this is an input call, so it's going to block. The reason it blocks is I want the process to stay alive so we can go look at its memory graph before it exits. Okay, so you just hit enter to exit. First, we're going to run this for tuples. Here you can see it took about half a second. Paste it over here so that we can see which one, what the relative performance was. And let's run Process Explorer, which lets us look down here at the details. So here's Python. You can see, if we open this up, go to Performance Graph. Right now it's using 145.7 megabytes in private bytes. So we'll note that here. Let's run name tuples. So it's an interesting question to ask if these absolute bare minimum tuples that can't expand, don't have names, things like that, how do they compare both in performance and memory of our named tuple that we created up here above, like so, using our collections.name tuple? All right, let's run it and see how it works. Okay, well, that is slower. Let's go ahead and copy that and put it in our little document here. So it's about three times slower, as you'd expect. It's doing quite a bit more work to parse those and, and so on. Let's look at the memory here. 
the memory is about the same, 143.3, so no big deal. Let's move down the line here and run it for our standard class. So this one is probably going to have the least good performance from a memory perspective, because remember, every instance could have been modified dynamically at runtime to have new attributes and so on, so they all have their own dictionary. Well, let's give it a shot and find out what happens. In terms of speed, it's almost identical to named tuples. That's cool. What about memory? Whoa, memory's a little more, like almost 100 megabytes more. So 241. All right, now here's where it's going to get interesting. If we run slots, I would expect it to take more time. It's doing comparable stuff to what those two are taking. However, the memory story should be pretty interesting. Let's see what it is. How close is it going to be, say, to the class versus the name tuple versus the, the regular tuple? All right, let's let it go and see what happens. Time-wise, faster than name tuples. That's cool. Now, let's go look at the memory. Look at that, 139.3. That's pretty interesting, 139.3 MB. Not only does this completely, completely do better than regular classes, it actually does better than name tuples, and it even does better than regular tuples. So we get the best memory usage using the slots here, and we save 101 megabytes. So that's a huge improvement. Now let's go look back at our type here. Remember, regular tuples are very useful, but they are very inflexible. They would not be a good stand-in for a class most of the time. Name tuples are better. At least they have names for their properties. So like if I had one here, a, B, C, and D, and so on. That's cool. But again, they can't have methods and, and whatnot. On the far other end of the spectrum, we have regular custom classes that are extremely rich. Properties, methods, inheritance, overloads, and so on. But this one pays a huge price. So what's interesting is we can get basically all of those features except the ability to dynamically add fields to instances at runtime after we create them. If we're willing to give up that thing, we can get huge memory improvements while still keeping all the flexibility and power of classes. Now, I want to take a moment and just say, do not do this by default. This is not the Pythonic thing to do. This is not how Python is meant to work. It's supposed to work in this nice, flexible, dynamic way. But understanding how the memory works in these types and the ability to take control over that and change it when you need it, when you can say, I could put this one line here and we save nine gigabytes of RAM on our server, and we can do way more processing or manage fewer servers, that's a huge win, and it may be worth it. So this may or may not be Pythonic. I'll leave that up to you, but I thought it was interesting to put it in here into this dictionary section because it makes a big difference. And on one hand, you say, what you're doing is kind of an abomination against the class. On the other, instead of being forced to use regular tuples, you can actually use rich types and even get better memory usage. So... You decide, but it's good to know about. Here's how you do it. You just set a dunder slots and set it to the name of the fields that you're going to use. Here we say A, B, and C. And henceforth, the only fields that you can have on this immutable thing are A, B, and C. If you, in the dunder init, try to take a D and say self.D equals something else, it would crash and say, nope, you cannot add a D. It takes A, B, and C. All right, so very strict about the variables it can have. But once you do this, it changes the way memory works behind the scene for the class. One more time, use this extremely sparingly, but it's a nice power to have if you need it. Thanks for watching. This video is just one of over 50 Pythonic techniques you'll learn in my full course. Check it out at talkpython.fm slash pythonic.